Um, so thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces from clinics, MRI scans, etc., and to meet lots of new people as well. So thank you for coming. Thank you again for taking part in the research. So as Michelle said, I'm going to be talking to you about the work we've been doing on REM sleep behavior disorder. So this means patients who have REM sleep behavior disorder who don't have Parkinson's disease. Because we think these people give us an opportunity, a very important opportunity, to look at the very early stages of Parkinson's. Okay, and hopefully what we want to do is identify the condition earlier so that we can ultimately treat earlier. Okay? So first things first, what is RBD? Well, this is the tabloid description. Um, and I'll try and give you something a little bit more scientific. So this is, uh, this is a diagram of, of a normal sleep cycle. So you can see that throughout the night, you go between different stages of sleep, from very deep sleep um, to very light sleep. And these light sleep um, stages here that are marked REM are rapid eye movement sleep. Now, a lot of dreaming occurs during rapid eye movement sleep. And in people who don't have RBD, the body is essentially paralyzed during the dreaming. And so you don't move in response to your dreams. People who have REM sleep behavior disorder lose that ability to inactivate their bodies while they're dreaming. And so they move in response to their dream content. The dream contents are often quite violent and quite nasty. And so people can fight in their sleep. And it's not uncommon for people to come to harm and injure themselves during sleep. So I've got a, a video here just to show you. I'm sure many of you will be um, familiar with this. So you can see this gentleman is in REM sleep. Um, and he's having quite a just distressing dream, as you can see. He's trying to fight something off with his pillow. Um, and you can quite see how that could uh, cause someone to injure themselves during sleep. OK, so moving on, what's, the, what's, the, what's this link between RBD and Parkinson's? Well, we have to think about how Parkinson's starts in the brain and how it develops. Now, in fact, there's some evidence that Parkinson's starts even outside the brain. Um, but we know that when it reaches the brain, the first places to be affected are low down in the brain here and also up here where your nose is, basically, where your sense of smell nerves are. And as it progresses, it travels up the brain stem to the basal ganglia here. And these are the structures that are responsible for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, so the tremor, the stiffness, the rigidity. Um, and after that, it can then in some individuals progress to other areas of the brain where it can start to affect things like memory. Okay? Now, as you can see from here, it has to travel quite a long way before you start getting the symptoms of Parkinson's, the part of the brain that's affected to give you the motor symptoms. But much earlier, it affects this center here, which controls rapid eye movement sleep. And so Degeneration here is what causes people to have RBD. Now, there are lots of other symptoms that come from um, degeneration that occurs before the motor symptoms. So that's why people often report that they lose their sense of smell. They might develop constipation in the years before they develop the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But the trouble is with those symptoms is that they're very common in the general population. So you can't use those to help you diagnose Parkinson's by themselves. RBD, on the other hand, is not common um, in the healthy population. And therefore, it's much more useful um, as a marker um, for early Parkinson's. Because people who develop RBD in the absence of Parkinson's have a very high risk of going on to develop Parkinson's at some point in the future. But there are some questions that are unanswered which we need to address. Okay? So firstly, which people with RBD will go on to develop Parkinsonism? Because some people may have RBD by itself for years or even decades without. And some people might have RBD for just a short period of time and then go on to develop Parkinson's. And we want to be able to identify those people. When will they convert to Parkinson's disease? As I said, this, there's an enormous range of times between developing RBD, developing Parkinson's disease. Um, and at the moment, it's difficult to, to determine um, who fits into which group. What type of Parkinsonism? Because not everybody will go on to develop Parkinson's itself. Some will develop a closely related condition. So that's things like 
um, Lewy body dementia, multiple system atrophy, and various other things that are related pathologically to Parkinson's. They're caused by similar underlying mechanisms. Um, but they have in some cases very different effects on the body and so it will be very useful to understand more about why some people develop one and why some people develop the other. And ultimately this is the question that we want to answer. Can we intervene early? Can we find out which people with RBD are at the highest risk of being about to get Parkinson's and intervene with treatments? For example like some of those mentioned by Michelle to slow down the underlying neurodegenerative process and ultimately prevent the onset of Parkinson's itself. So how are, we, how are we doing this? Well first I'm going to talk to you about some of the clinical findings from our clinic visits. So this will be very familiar to many of you. The people in the study who have RBD have all of the same assessments that people with Parkinson's have. So you have blood tests, sense of smell tests, this, the famous smartphone tests, blood pressure, and a whole host of other things that you may well be familiar with from clinic. Um, a subset of patients will also have brain scans, so MRI scans, that's here on the bottom right, and also, as Michelle mentioned, DAT scans. Uh, this is an example of a DAT scan here. So at the moment, we have 195 patients with RBD recruited into our cohort <coughs> since 2012, and that makes it one of the largest cohorts anywhere in the world, because RBD is rare. Okay, so this is a very large cohort, and we follow them up intensively every 18 months with very detailed assessments. What's really important is that, as I say, we do exactly the same assessments in people who have Parkinson's and in healthy control participants who don't have PD or RBD, and so we're able to compare very accurately. So what have we found? Well, let's look at the motor symptoms, okay? Now, on the left here, this is the famous UPDRS, you know, the finger tapping, all of this business, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So this is a specific test for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. What you can see here, yellow is controls, healthy controls, green is people with Parkinson's, and these are people early on in Parkinson's, so people within around six months of diagnosis and before they started medications. So you're seeing just the effect of the Parkinson's itself. Um, and then in blue, you see the people who have RBD who don't have Parkinson's. And as expected, people with PD have symptoms of PD, controls don't. RBD don't, but they might have one or two odd things. So the scores are higher than controls, even though they're nowhere near as high as in Parkinson's. So they might have a little bit of tremor, very mild rigidity, something like that, which isn't enough to make a diagnosis. However, when you look at some of the other tests that we do, so this is the get up and go, where you have to stand up, walk a few paces, turn around, walk back. And this one is the balance test, the flamingo test, standing on one leg. You see, actually, the people with RBD, and remember these are average scores, but on average, they're actually more like patients with early Parkinson's than they are like controls, and the same with balance. So even though they don't have symptoms of Parkinson's, there might be some very subtle early signs of movement problems. When we look at non-motor symptoms, we see, again, that when you look at sense of smell, blood pressure changes, constipation, you see actually most of the time the average RBD scores are more similar to PD than they are to controls. Now this isn't really surprising either because we know that a lot of these non-motor symptoms occur before the onset of, um, of motor symptoms. What's interesting on this slide is this one which shows you quality of life. This is patients rating their own quality of life and you can see that the combination of all of these other non-motor features means that people with RBD are even rating their quality of life about the same as people who have just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And I think this highlights the importance of non-motor symptoms in affecting quality of life. And a, a lot of that, I think, is down to what we can see on the next slide. So this is looking at cognitive and psychiatric features. So here we have cognition, memory, really. Um, and then we have anxiety, depression, and apathy, three neuropsychiatric features. And you can see here something slightly unusual, that actually the patients with RBD, on average, score worse in all of these measures. Okay, so that's not quite what we would expect because we think they're at a much earlier stage. In fact, they're worse. Now, what's emerging is a picture of RBD being a bit different from just early Parkinson's in general. And we've seen that also with our genetic data. So 
we've tested for two common mutations that put people at risk of Parkinson's, LARC2 you may have heard of, and GBA. Now, LARC2 is present in about 3% of people with Parkinson's, this mutation, but between us and another group in Barcelona, we've now tested around 300 RBD patients for this mutation, and we haven't found a single one. So we think this is something different in people who have RBD. GBA, on the other hand, is the reverse. So we see that roughly twice as, twice as commonly in people with RBD as we do with people with Parkinson's disease. So what we're, what the picture that's emerging here from this clinical data is, number one, we can see a lot of these non-motor features in people with RBD, and we think that in many cases that will be early features of Parkinson's. What we also see, though, is that perhaps RBD is not typical of early Parkinson's as a whole, but maybe a particular subtype um, of, of, of the process, um, which maybe causes more severe um, scores on things like psychiatric features. Okay. So, how can we use this information on an individual basis to try and, to try and help us answer these questions that I put at the start? Well, what we have to do, and this is one of the hardest and saddest parts of my job, is to follow people longitudinally and watch to see whether or not people do develop Parkinson's. And because we've been um, looking at this for a long time now, we do have some early data from this. So, of our 195 patients with RBD, at the moment, 21 of those have gone on to develop Parkinson's or a closely related disorder. Roughly about half have developed Parkinson's and about half have developed some of the other conditions that I mentioned earlier. Now, you can see that this highlights, again, some of the questions that I, I raised at the start. Um, how do you distinguish between these? And also, if you look at the bottom, at the average time between developing RBD and developing the condition that they've gone on to develop. It's 10 years after their RBD symptoms on average, um, and five and a half years after they were diagnosed um, with RBD. So it's, it's, it's a long time interval, and what we'd like to be able to do is narrow that down with a bit more precision. So the first thing that we can do to help us with that is to take all of these clinical scores that we've looked at in clinic, weight them according to their, how important we think they are as markers of Parkinson's and put them all together into a big calculation and come up with an overall risk score. Um, and when you do that, um, this is what you see. So don't worry about the, the numbers, but this is the risk score. So the higher you are up here, the more at risk we think you are. Um, so people, the healthy controls, of course, are very low. Um, People who have RBD and have stayed just as RBD are higher risk. That's what we know, because we know people with RBD are at risk of Parkinson's. But the people who have gone on to convert to other disorders, when we saw them at their first visit, they were already higher risk. So you can see that although there is some overlap here, there starts to be a distinction. So perhaps we can use all of these clinical signs together to help us as to help us narrow it down a little bit and, and see who's going to be at high risk and who's at low risk. But this isn't enough by itself. So what I'm interested in doing is refining this even further by looking at brain imaging. So that's some of the things I showed you earlier on MRI and DAT scan so that we can actually visualize what's going wrong in the brain. So just to remind you, this is the neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease. It starts at the bottom here and progresses <coughs> upwards. So what we'd like to do is image this part of the brain um, so that we can see some of these early changes. Now, this is a slide that you've probably seen before. This was work done by my predecessor, Harry Relinsky, and this is really important work. This is looking at the activity of the basal ganglia, so not quite high up in that picture. Um, and what this showed, which is important, is that some of the activity changes that you see in Parkinson's, that's along the top, are also there when you look at people with RBD. So we do know that we can detect some changes. Um, and you can see that, as with many of the clinical features, the RBD look pretty similar to the Parkinson's patients, more so than they do to, to the healthy controls. So we know that there, is, there are some changes there that, that we can look at, but what we'd like to be able to do is look more precisely at, on an individual basis. So the next thing that I've been doing over the past year is what we call DAT scans. Now these are scans that label specifically the dopamine 
transporters in the brain. And that's a measure of how these dopamine cells are, um, how, how they're suffering and how healthy they are. And this is a normal DAT scan here. And so you can see there's a nice bright signal which is fairly symmetrical. And what you see in uh, Parkinson's disease, but also in some people who have RBD, is asymmetry. So you can see on the right here um, that some of the signal has been, has been lost. Uh, okay, at the back, sort of posteriorly here. Okay, and so that makes it not symmetrical. What you see in some other cases is overall a general loss of signal, even though it stays symmetrical. And what we think is that these different patterns um, of abnormalities might be important in determining how one individual is going to progress. We know that these changes occur some years before the onset of Parkinson's, and so we think that the pattern might give us some useful information. Of course, we need long-term follow-up to be able to say that, but this is very important data for us to be collecting at the moment. The next slide I'm going to show you is even more early data, even more provisional, something that we're working on right at the moment, which is to look at something a bit lower down the brain stem so that per perhaps we can look even earlier. And this is the substantia nigra. Now, this is what the substantia nigra looks like. This is a post-mortem cross-section of the brain stem. And you can see that in this healthy brain, it looks black. So nigra means black. Um, the cells here, which are the dopamine-containing cells, also contain this black pigment. So you can see that they stand out quite well. And in someone with Parkinson's, they lose that pigmentation as they lose those dopamine cells. Now, what we're working on is, is a way of detecting this using MRI. So looking at this picture here, ignore the yellow bands. I'll tell you what they are in a moment. But you can see that this is the same structure as this. And you can see that with this scan sequence, the areas that are black are lighter, okay? That's all you need to see from this picture. And what we can do then is identify an area next to it here, these yellow areas, and say, this is not the substantia nigra, these are dark areas. Find us the areas which are bright compared to this yellow area, okay? And then we can automatically label the substantia nigra, which the computer has done here in green, by saying these blobs here, these green blobs, are brighter than this. And then what we can do is count all of these green blobs, and that gives us an idea of the size of that dark area, okay? We can also um, calculate the brightness of these blobs, okay? And so we think that that might be able to give us a good indication of how healthy this area of the brain is. Okay, but we don't want to stop just there. We can also delve even further into the substantia nigra and look specifically at this back part, which is the most vulnerable cells in Parkinson's. And you can see here in this image of a healthy brain that it's on this, this is a separate sequence, so it's not showing you the same thing as the one on the previous slide. And so in this case, the, the substantia nigra in general is dark, but it has this white blob at the back, okay, and that's what it looks like um, in people who don't have Parkinson's. And what you see in people who do is that this starts to, starts to go and people lose this. So we can look e in even more detail at the substantia nigra itself. Now, you might remember right at the start I showed you a red blob um, on the brain of where we think the area that controls REM sleep is, and that was even lower down, so potentially even earlier, okay? And Fortunately for us, those cells also contain this dark pigment, so we can see those too. And that's what you can see here in this picture. So there's a bright white blob there and a bright white blob there. And people who have Parkinson's and who have RBD start to lose that bright signal. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. I'd like to summarize by just showing you this. This is our overall aim. So this is what we're trying to achieve. You see in a bit of detail. What we want to do is identify people from the community who are at increased risk. We want to be able to detect RBD better so that we don't have just 100 or 200 RBD patients, but we can easily gather thousands. Then we want to do the clinical assessments, narrow it down a little bit, do the brain imaging assessments, narrow it down even more. And then that will leave us with some people who are at particularly high risk who we can then give these treatments to, both in neuroclinical trials um, and also ultimately 
um, in clinical practice. So thank you again to everybody who's taken part in the study um, and thank you to you all for listening. Thank you.